Okay, then I believe we can kick it off. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another round of the European Data Portal and the Support Center for Data Sharing's Data Talk session. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Katarina Onyilopu. I apologize for my bad pronunciation and invite you to correct me um, on how to properly say your name. She will be discussing how to perform open data and to share what's happening in the open data and data, sh data sharing space in Ukraine. Katarina, I give the floor to you. Uh, hi, you almost said it, my surname correctly. It's Onyilopu, yes, uh, and I work um, I work in a project Tapas. It's uh, USAID UK funded uh, transparency and accountability in public administration project, which actually supports the Ministry of Digital Transformation in the sphere of open data. And actually, I work with the national open data team. Uh, and usually, I don't say I work with national open data team. I usually say I work as a part of national open data team because for us, we don't see the differences of who works where. It's about one team who is uh, uh, representable of all different people who uh, have their own, uh, uh, who support the program in so different ways. So uh, for the last four years, I actively work in the sphere. And actually, this is a time when um, open data sphere in Ukraine became quite active, quite dynamic, and started showing a lot of impact in different spheres of Ukrainian life. And for us, in usually for our team, uh, we have four, four priorities, uh, four, uh, yeah, four priorities in which we work uh, at the same time. So first one, uh, obviously, it's all about regulatory, regulatory framework for open data. We need to make sure that the work is done is sustainable. For us, the development of regulatory framework is actually quite important for that re the reason of sustainability. We don't want uh, government bodies to open up the data uh, because they have political will or because it's voluntary or because it's cool. No, for us, important that it's done because they have to, they have to renew, uh, they have to sustain the quality of data. The government officials have to make sure the highest quality and have to respond to the feedback from uh, general from the uh, public and the users of open data. So uh, we have this uh, decree 835, which actually dictates which kind of data sets have to be uh, published. And what I actually, uh, uh, for me, what's special about this decree, because, oh, this is just another decree from some government body. No, for us, it's a special thing because every year we renew it. We, it this is like our way of engaging with civil society and businesses and ask, so what data sets are we missing from the list? Because as we, the sphere is developed, we find out more and more and we have different uh, growing demand uh, for different data sets. So every year uh, we do the open call to community asking, tell us what data sets do you need? What something is there written in the decree that you see doesn't work? And this is the same uh, for government officials. They, uh, for example, um, they can provide this information on what's written in the decree that they don't understand, that needs to be expanded, they need to be removed and so on. So I'm really excited to the fact that uh, we have this mechanism of engaging with community, with users, and make sure that the decree, uh, this legal document, is actually corresponding to the need of users and not there just like to have a decree. So uh, this, like 21st of October, we're going to have five years anniversary of decree, and we're actually planning to celebrate it. Um, and I hope maybe you'll write a blog post for European Data Portal just to talk about the approach we took to developing the decree and how we communicate this community and how it's changed from the uh, first days when open data in Ukraine was just for geeks to now when open data is for businesses and millions of Ukrainians using the data. So this is like a story there. So yeah, this is first, it's like regulation, right? Second one uh, for us is important is capacity building. So we need to work with government officials to teach them, to learn them how to publish open data. And we have to engage with community to, uh, to populate the data sets 
and uh, to engage with users to, to use open data. So for us, capacity building, it comes on a different level from government officials to different audiences of users. And uh, in the past, we run quite a few training programs. We provided some learning materials, like usual stuff. But this year we realized, no, this is not enough. Uh, we need to think about scaling. Uh, we need to reach beyond existing communities and we have to reach ukraine is big we can we, we, we cannot focus only on the biggest cities and so on we have to think about sustainable uh, sustainably scaling uh, the use of open data and the publishing of open data so actually this year at the moment we are working on uh developing the national center of competence for open data so both online and offline so we uh, we developed and adjusted um, uh, this framework. Open uh, there is uh, Open Data Institute in the past developed this uh, framework, learning framework in the sphere of open data. So you can uh, select which level of the user you are, uh, which knowledge do you need, and so on. So we we are working on this um, tool, this resource, where the person can do a little test, find out how uh, which level they are. Are they somebody who is beginner, or you are a strategist, or you're actually a practitioner, and we'll provide you the path of learning and open data. So uh, I hope that like in a, a couple of months, we'll be able to present it to Ukrainian public and actually get a feedback on this learning cycle, learning processes. And then third one for us, obviously, open data portal. We love our portal because it's as like our degree. We always work on making sure it's um, it's it has good uh, technical capacity, but also uh, what's important to us that we get feedback from the users on how how well uh, uh, how well they can use the portal, how you like easy how easy it is. And actually, last <laughs> last year we did some analy analysis. Uh, we do a lot of Google Analytics on our portal. We do a lot like we started like. We always promote use open data, but then let's use our own data uh, from the portal that we collected to analyze what is the behavior even of the user on portal and what if, what people are looking for and uh, which um, because usually we have on the portal all different sections with different type of information and like do they actually read it? Do they use it? Is it is it actually useful? And actually we realized that most people looked just for data, which is fantastic, and they didn't want any other information there. <laughs> like it was useless. <laughs> uh, that's why we actually decided, okay, so we saw the data and we have to make a decision on the data to attract more users and make sure it's quite accessible. So uh, at the moment, actually, we're changing the design of the portal. We would like to strip down uh, all those things that nobody cares about and focus on the accessibility and uh, making sure that person can find the data that they that they looking for and they need. So this is a, like we have lots of things in the process in the working. But yeah, technical capacity uh, this is quite important for us. And uh, first one actually it's innovation. This is kind of like what this topic of this conversation is about. It's about innovation with open data and um, actually. Uh, for the last four years, we ran Open Data Challenge. We actually uh, took the idea of UK's Open Data Challenge and got inspired by actually European Open Data Incubator uh, that finished a couple of years ago, but had a great impact on how we design our incubation programs. And each year uh, we run incubation program for the startups that would like that using op Ukrainian open data. And actually, uh, at first, uh, at first when we started this uh, challenge, uh, we uh, we actually were, we started such an early stage. We always were scared that oh maybe uh, there are no startups. There would not be startups using open data. But actually, um, we noticed that um, it was a starting point, and the demand for that kind of support. And incubation grew every year. So I think for the four year four years we had almost a thousand applications from all over Ukraine. And 
for this period of time, uh, I think we financed around more like uh, 20 something startups. And the startups manage, uh, manage to have a product and actually started making money, make a profit out of those products and grow their users. So uh, what I really, uh, and this is like engaging with a startup community and uh, we opened a lot of eyes to different startups. There is data that's in that topic and they can utilize it. So uh, I can see from, uh, I can see now that it has, it's probably one of our most successful projects uh, because we really grew this ecosystems of users. Uh, and we, there are lots of products created that use open data. And for me, it's quite interesting. Uh, I always was interested in actually in the business models of how, I, how, do, how do you actually make money out of uh, open data? Like it's free, obviously it's open data is free. So how do you make money out of it? And I noticed uh, that uh, the most uh, projects, uh, the most famous one, like op uh, we have open data bot, you control, we have uh, code in the palm, you can just count and count and count them. They actually aggregate different sources of data to find out information about something. For example, a company, right? You have a company and you want to check the company and you, there is no one place to find out all information about companies. So you have to use business register. You, can, you have to use the register uh, around like tax register if the painter. It's a different one. It's a different uh, government body that uh, collects the data. Then you have courts register. It's again, totally different. And usually the data is not particularly, uh, it's not particularly uh, interoperable. So uh, all the startups, they started create. They use this um, aggregation method of aggregating information about something from different sources and giving this info in few seconds, in few clicks, like whatever, in a bot, in a chat bot, right? Uh, now, uh, I think in Ukraine, most people don't use business register anymore as a register. They usually go to the services, click, and here we go, here we go. And we have like millions, millions of users. People don't know that's based on open data. They don't need to know, every user doesn't need to know how it's, how it's made but actually they're using it. Like, so our estimated is that, for example, uh, comp checking company, this kind of practice uh, using open data, it's uh, as mi minimum two and a half million of Ukrainians. It's minimum. It's like really, really like a number that um, like we need to count it better, but this is the minimal number um, that we can say for sure right now. Or for example, when I say checking something, we have like a build, uh, uh, we have lots of uh, buildings in Ukraine. You need to buy a flat uh, in a new building and you need to check is this, bu is this building uh, and the company who is building this building actually have all the permits. Because in Ukraine we have problems uh, that there is high corruption uh, risks in Ukraine around these permits and you need to check. Uh, oh, well, so am I risking all my money, investing my money into this uh, beautiful whatever flat? And then I'll always, and I have problems with the documents. And actually, we have lots of scandals in Ukraine when big buildings find, uh, they appear in Kiev and people say, well, but here we had to, the building had to have four floors. Why it's 20 floors? Like, why it's so high? And um, obviously, uh, they have the legal issues. So, so for example, other services like Monitor Estate, we have Nora, they aggregate in the information about buildings. So the most like the most successful uh, businesses in Ukraine around open data, it's actually aggregating information about particular things in particular sphere, right? So, um, and I think it solves the problem, problem of the fact that data is not interoperable because uh, startups that are technologically save you, they find out the ways of connected all of it together <laughs> and provide the services. And what recently, and like uh, kind of wanted to go into our new, um, uh, like in, uh, in another priority that we have, but kind of links to this one about studying the impact of uh, open data and understanding 
how it's being used, uh, not in the ways that we just know, know as a community, right? So for example, uh, now when we look at the impact of business and uh, let's say checking of the companies, uh, for me, I found out li literally like a few days ago, I was pretty excited that most banks in Ukraine, banks, big banks, they actually use, they integrate these products who are aggregating the data. They use the API of the services integrated into their service. So when I'm the user of the banking service, come uh, use my application as a like, business owner, and I would like to make a payment, I already can see who I'm, who I'm paying the money, <laughs> you know? Uh, and there are cases where uh, business owners, they change their mind like, no, 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 this is not the company we're working on. I probably shouldn't pay money. So we have major banks slowly integrating the APIs from open data. And actually uh, we see that uh, the use is, is spread pretty deep into like into all sorts of population and actually it's thanks to this aggregation aggregation services so that's what i really uh what's really fascinating for me at how money is being made uh, in ukraine however like uh, usually all these business models are built around premium model and more normal people just people activists, journalists, they get all of this uh, data for free. But if you're commercial services, please pay us for the using of the data. And probably you need it so high that we need to charge. Basically, this is the logic of how it all works. And in general, I think this is like our priority, like this uh, study in impact is our biggest priority this year, particularly. So. For the first time, we started looking into different um, spheres and seeing so what which data sets have impact. And let's unpack all the stories around the impact. Uh, so we looked into building sphere, recently launched a report looking at the buildings, uh, looking at this sphere, talking about particular cases with numbers or, and scenarios, actually just not just to show, oh, this is then doing, doing this and that, but actually uh, unpack the whole scenario of how it's happening. Um, yeah. Uh, and next we are looking into the health, into the repair of roads, uh, then uh, public the transparency and public finance and so on so we have a big api on case studies uh this year but we see that this is the only way to tell the simple stories do a deep research but then tell a simple stories of the use this is how we will be able to scale uh the use and of the open data to even wide public um so this is uh, yeah our story but actually uh, if we talk about open data like we have still lots of challenges but we are uh, working on it but i think um, less developed thing in ukraine is shared data right so because uh, and we started we probably just like organically started thinking about this uh, topic because uh, we saw that some places there were need to discuss these topics or start discussing and think how does this sh how what does it mean sharing data right how is one shares in another what kind of regulation do we need to make it uh, I don't know uh, to make to make it work and we are just standing nowhere with this <laughs> I think uh, uh, I think this is uh, it's kind of um, Mm, yeah, we only start thinking that because uh, we have like this interesting con uh, kind of problem. So, uh, so if you uh, if you have high quality open data, uh, then uh, some government bodies would like to uh, to provide services uh, that the user will pay for some data right uh, because it's a question of sustainability uh, if you would like uh, for most people for government officials the question of sustainability uh, to make sure data up to date that is through api that uh, it can be used but at the same time our community says well uh, this is public information it all should be free all the data always free 
no can be no charge for it or not. So, but we have like some practices when some of the data is actually being shared uh, just with few companies, the users, and they conclude some agreements and kind of uh, pay for it and so on. But actually it's kind of, there is no re like regulation around it. We, do, we don't know, I cannot say if some government body who is charging, is it normal price for it? Is it more expensive? How should they pay for it? And so on. So I think this is something like a next year uh, in our sphere to think about and figure out uh, how does, how should it work in Ukraine? Yeah, so I think I talked so much. <laughs> you did a very um, concise and detailed overview about the current um, the current situation for both open data and now data sharing in Ukraine with very concrete examples. Thank you for that. I also now want to open the floor to the audience. Um, if they have any questions for Katarina, you are free to either unmute yourself or raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask or to type it in the chat. Otherwise, I also have a series of questions. I love questions. Um, have a <laughs> I'm usually the one who's asking all the questions, so a lot of questions. Otherwise, my first question link, linked back to one of your um, four points about capacity building and engaging with the community. But how exact, so Ukraine is um, quite broad with different um, digit, with different technological levels in different regions and uh, cities. How exactly are you engaging with such a broad community um, and still ensuring that you get a representative sample from the different stakeholders and different interested parties? Mm. Uh, well, uh, how, how do we pl plan our like engagement, right? For us, um, we, focus, we know that some data sets are super valuable, some that are not super valuable, but it's important they're open. Uh, so we try to engage on on particular uh, engaged community in particular that's, that's, that's let's say we work in ecology we open up the data in ecology sector so who is our audience in ecology sector who are these NGOs who, in this, who is using it who are those startups that are using this data who are potential users so we always try to like do this community mapping and figure out uh, who, who is it interest for so not to reach wider audience, not knowing who are those people and like uh, hope we're gonna reach them, but actually focus on particular communities. Uh, and usually uh, thanks to this, like methods are not important here because it can be, uh, it can be different. We, we like, uh, uh, we like also all sorts of hackathons, camps, uh, uh, trainings. This is, doesn't matter how you do it. But actually, uh, we try to engage in a particular sphere uh, communities to make sure it's being used. And then as we engage with them, we receive more demand and it's like rolling stone. You keep like grow this and grow and grow and grow. So actually now, if you look into each community, uh, our open national open the team, we can actually point out. So, ah, the user said one, two, three, four, five. Da, 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 da. We can actually um, be, we grow our knowledge and we see how they're using it. And uh, what I like, those communities are now are uh, the ones who, um, uh, they're the ones who kind of request data all the time. So, oh, okay, thank you. Good data sets, we want more. <laughs> and they companion to you to open up more data. And for me, actually, this is what I like the most. When I see that those communities who we engage with, they start requesting and doing campaigning and being successful and more data is opened up, not by us, but thanks to their effort. This is for me a real win. It's like, okay, we made our job. They know how to do it. They can work with government. They can be as an NGO, as government, whatever, NGO startups. They've done it once, they can do it more times. So that's it. They learn like the cycle, right? This is I think the, part, the like height of our uh, six, like what success for me is in the sphere as a national open data team. So this is how yeah, uh, uh, this is how we engage in most of the times. Okay. Another question in chat: um, Do you notice any resistance from government bodies to share their data? Well, 
I think in general, shared data, open data, the resistance will be there all the time. Like you cannot escape from the resistance. It's just, I think the conversation um, is just conversation is changing. Like when we started four years ago, uh, most people ask, so what is this open data thing? You know, people ask what it is, uh, but now uh, government officials know exactly what it is and when the government officials resist so much like okay guys something is wrong here what are you hiding so actually their resistance brings a lot of questions to the community it's like are you hiding this registers because the, the the corruption is hidden there like what are the, the practices that you hide for example we had a massive story uh, in december last year when the construction permits register was opened. So the register, uh, the community asked for the, to open this register for the last three years. But the, the actually the sphere is so corrupt that we understood that the register is not being opened for particular reasons. And actually when the register was open, uh, the exact register, you could see how government officials wrote uh, some notes for themselves, approve permit or not. So actually, the, you know what I mean? It's like, we opened the register like, oh my God, everyone was like, what are those notes? What these people were writing? This is like, do not send, don't give permission. Doesn't mean they're gonna, sometimes they contact and say, oh, I need more money to get you into the register and so on. So it uncovered massive corruption, um, uh, corruption uh, uh, schemes. And I'm so happy uh, that uh, it's kind of like I'm having this register been open, but we understand that when we we advocate for the open, you know, some data sets and open, we like we like uncover not just like for us. It's not about anymore about opening data itself, we understand that it can cover a lot of corruption issues. So it's like a big corruption fight, not fight, but like uh, struggle, yeah, corruption struggle uh, that we have. But it's, it's, it's not that many, I would say, in Ukraine. Uh, now it's getting better and better. And actually, thanks uh, to political will, our vice prime minister, uh, minister of digital transformation of Ukraine, uh, supports a lot of this work and one by one we tackle all the government officials who refuse uh, one by one <laughs> yeah I'm glad to hear that there's uh, less resistance and uh, those who do resist you have some interesting findings yeah. I'd like to open the floor to John Franco then who also has a question I can't uh, <laughs> thank you for being with us uh, today first of all uh, with reference to what you were just saying that's an interesting concept sometimes used of um, working like we were in surrounded by glass walls. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to take privacy or uh, from civil servants. We just want them to be aware that because of the nature of their work, uh, the citizens may have simply the right to, 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 to check in it. And so it's absolutely in their rights to write notes for themselves to remind about stuff, as long as that stuff is like, legit. <laughs> uh, and we don't want them to feel resistance simply because expecting the citizens to be at their back spying on how they work. It's just a matter of inspecting how, how their taxpayers' money is spent and how the democracy is administered. Uh, my question is uh, in reference to something you said earlier that, that caught my attention a lot, which is you are evaluating how to make the, uh, the portal, the new portal, uh, more, let's say, down to the point, uh, the essential features being required or not. And that feels to me a bit in contradiction with some of the trends you see out there, adding more frills and visualization and stuff that yeah. moves and, and sings and dances. Uh, how did you um, discover this kind of, of demand from your users? How, how clear is that? Is it something you can perhaps offer us as a learning? Uh, what should we look at if to realize that we are perhaps we are exaggerating with cool features and, and getting away from the basics? Well, um, basically, it's when, when I talk stripped down of things on the portal, I don't mean that it's going to disappear. It's a, it, it means uh, that uh, it, that uh, how do I say it correctly? We cre we created this concept of national uh, center for, of competence, where actually it's gonna be uh, 
like we're gonna have impact stories we're gonna have um i don't know training materials we're gonna have like cool videos news uh, we're gonna notify about our strategy how we work what successes we have so like all of the stuff is gonna be cooler more engaging uh written better words it's not it's gonna be technical open data things that nobody understands you read and like oh my god what's written in the sentence what they want what is this decree right we want uh kind of rework to make our to make the language about open data easier i think right so if you want to use data here's the portal loving it take your data but if you want to engage all this wow won't be part of the ecosystem here the part for you so i think it's it's not just about stripping some or moving something but it's about making language easier uh more uh, accessible to normal person not just a geek or whatever 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 so uh for this i think uh, we we use a lot of google analytics like we analyze each page each page so how many views how many views how many views and we realized that things that we try to do and the way we try to do it just didn't didn't work um so okay so what do we have it why i when i use some kind of let's say product i i want just to have my problem solved right so i want like i don't know whatever have my problem solved when i look on a date uh, on a data portal my problem is you look for data so that's what you need to find and i want to make sure that your problem is for solved easily and you don't you don't have to understand all the regulation and do something else and something else just you have a clear path so uh and I, i'm actually quite disappointed by our team that we didn't use the google analytics before in such a deep way we just had our assumptions and we're happy with it and suddenly it's an interesting it's an interesting point on that because um recently uh we've been actually talking with the member states for something called the daisy uh, that is one of the research work um that uh, Europe does to understand the progress of the member states. And some countries are actually concerned that if uh, user analytics is too aggressive, uh, it may actually violate the privacy of the users. That's an interesting point. So um, I'm all with you uh, about uh, the need to understand what our users need, because otherwise there's no point. We, we may risking uh, uh, throwing taxpayer money out of the window. At the same time, it's important that probably, the, particularly the techies among us, the ones to actually build the systems for us, are aware to be cautious there. Um, even just for respect of people's privacy or perceived privacy, um, mm -hmm. uh, we can analyze as much as we like, as long as we are careful what we do with the data that we destroyed afterwards and we aggregated, blah, blah, blah. And the, the consent is captured. And, and the original spirit is maintained. But I'm sure you, you do this already. And if you don't, don't, don't tell anyone, but tell your tech is here. <laughs> well, we don't know who, like, we just see numbers, moves, and so on. This is all uh, anonymous. Uh, so exactly. thanks, yeah, I exactly. don't want to be engaged in that. I don't really need to know, uh, like, uh, to be engaged in this kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, like, we need like we need to like this year what we understood that we need to, to get out of our uh, cuddly space where we're so happy and make all those assumptions and like oh this is so cool and apparently it's not so cool and actually uh we are, we, we are not scared uh, to learn all the time and change uh i think yeah uh like the sphere is growing, we are growing as a people, like as a team, we are growing, we are changing, and we have constantly to adapt uh, to make it better. Why not? Uh, this is our job. <laughs> so use data to make more use of data. <laughs> Thank you, then. Um, I will open the floor for one last question. Um, either unmute and speak or message in the chat to ask a question or otherwise we can look to wrapping up for today in mind of time as well. Yeah. It seems that there are no further questions. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina, for joining and for sharing these amazing insights into the situation in Ukraine. 
for those who are interested, there's also a country blog post um, written by Katarina about how to profit from open data in Ukraine available on the European Data Portal. For those who want to revisit um, what was discussed here, this recording or this um, session was recorded and will be live next Monday and shared on the EDP channels. We look forward to further engaging with you and joining these sessions going forward. And Katarina, it was a pleasure. Please continue to share um, your work and your insights with us. And we, of course, are happy to also support you in promoting it and supporting the increase in awareness and impact of open data across and beyond Europe. And Irina, perhaps we can add data. that we are, we are populating our calendar for the future data stories. So if you have a nice data story to tell, let us know. Uh, write to us at info at European data portal .eu or info at EU or data sharing .eu. Yeah. A lot of you. Uh, and uh, let us know what you would like to, to share with the community. And we'll be, be happy to consider this with you. Exactly. If you have any upcoming events, any news or insights that you're aware of, or any practical examples of use cases that utilize open data, please don't hesitate to contact us uh, either via the emails John Franco shared or via our social media channels, how you found us, most likely. Yeah. In the meantime, have a good afternoon, everyone, and stay dry. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.